first chapter of the book. And it's like, I, I didn't expect this from Jeff Chang, right? I don't know, I don't know why, but I just didn't expect you to get so bluesy. Um, and, and actually, um, yeah, it's just, it's just, I just read it as a blues, but when you talk about the words at the end, of the last sentence says, uh, um, it's something about like, like, word, like words that can change us. And, it, and it's so ideal. And I believe it, right? I believe in art, obviously. But I, I, will, I want to ask you, do you really believe that words can change, like, us? I think so. Yeah. Um, I do. I really do. I'm, all right. I mean, I might come off as, as silly or naive or whatever. I'm naive, too, um, but I, I just thought you were better than that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I'm stupid. Mm -hmm. I'm stupid and naive. Um, and, and you kind of have to be. I mean, like to get through a lot of this stuff, yeah? I mean, okay, so, um, so yeah, I think that, I think that words can free, and I think that you believe that, otherwise you wouldn't be writing, yeah. um, and writing so deeply the way that you write. Um, but I, I mean, like, just to take words, all right? Like, a couple weeks ago, the Associated Press uh, decided that in their style book, they were gonna drop the word illegal in reference oh. to a human being. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was only going to be used in reference to a system of laws, um, in this case, laws around immigration, right. right? So you could have illegal immigration because you can make a law, and a law determines what's legal and what's illegal. But a person can't be illegal. And this is what folks have been arguing for decades upon decades. And, of course, Rinku Sen and Monica Novoa from the Drop the Eyewear campaign have been pushing it really, really hard. Um, over the last like two, three years. And I thought that that was huge. Um, because if you, look at, if you look at, say for instance, what GLAD was doing back in the 80s, um, they were trying to get rid of the term homosexual. Um, and that's because it focused on the language that was about uh, denigration, it was about deviance, right? So the sociology and psychology of deviance. And they wanted to get to a positive space of talking about identity, right? And they were able to be successful with that in 87. And I dare say if they hadn't been successful in 87, we wouldn't have had Ellen mm. DeGeneres coming out, mm. you know, almost 10 years later, right? We wouldn't have had a shift in the debate mm -hmm. um, that we've had around same-sex marriage. It would have been about homosexual marriage. Mm -hmm. Is that even considerable? You know I mean? Like, possible to think about mm -hmm. in that sense? Mm -hmm. So I felt like, you know, we're not gonna necessarily see immediately how the shifting of this, dropping of this word illegal is going to impact, say, the bill that's in Congress right now, which is equal parts great and equal parts incredibly shitty, right? right? Um, but what we know is, is that we're now in a position to be able to say, okay, you talk about it as illegal, I want to talk about the human stakes of this, okay. right? Immigrants, people are not illegal. Uh, you can make them illegal. So let's have a discussion about that. And I think that that's like an example of how the words can change and words can free. Um, not by itself, obviously. Like, us sitting here and, and talking isn't gonna change you know, the world all by itself, right. I don't think. But hopefully a little bit of what we're doing and what millions of people are doing will. Right. So. So, so implicit in that last paragraph of that piece and what you just said is really the idea that words have free. And, and so even though the multi might have won, it, it, it could have been worse? It absolutely, I think. It could have been worse. It could have been worse. Yeah. yeah that's scary. That's pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really scary. Um, I wanted to ask you, can I ask you, like, why did you decide that you wanted to frame this narrative around kids, around teenagers? Uh, in long division? That's a good question. Um, I got my friend Jamal Issa Wiki here. Went to college with him, and he started a, a, a school, a charter school. He was like 24 years old, and um, I, I was always like uh, not envious of what Bali did, but you know, I think we had the same education. We talked about a lot of the same things in college, and I, I, I don't know what motivated him, for example, but I, I just always thought, you know, I'm up here at this kind of sort of elite school, trying to make some money so I can, you know, eat good, so my grandma, and my mother, and everybody else can eat pretty. Uh, but nothing, I wasn't getting, like, I, I could have created art that a younger me and my 
nephews and nieces would never, ever consume. And so again, like, because I do believe that words matter, I do believe that if we're talking about young black kids particularly, I don't believe that they're ever really talked to um, except via hip hop, right? Um, and I think Southern black young kids aren't really hardly ever talked to in literature um, at all. And so I wanted to talk to them while honoring the people who came before me, Octavia Butler, Paul Beatty, uh, you know, Morrison, Mark Walker, Alexander. But, but I wanted to talk to them. So, so before I could write the book, I had to go home, I had to do uh, a lot of different, uh, have a lot of conversations with younger people. I work with a lot of young folks at Poughkeepsie because, you know, the language changes. Like I can't have the narrators talking about how shit is so fresh, you know. <laughs> it's, it's not going to work. Um, <laughs> But, 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 but again, the idea was that I, I just wanted to try to write something to people that who aren't normally written to, uh, yeah, they aren't written to, they're spoken to, or they're like, try, you know, people try to convince them to buy shit they shouldn't buy, do shit they shouldn't do, but, but I wanted to, to see if I could talk to them, talk to myself, talk to my grandmother in the same text. So that's why I kind of had to do a time travel, I think, mean, to make it work. Yeah. And so, I mean, there's kind of really a lot of really interesting intergenerational types of things that are, that are happening there. Can you kind of unpack a little bit of what you're trying to trying to do there as far as the dialogue between parents and kids that are happening? And, and yeah, I, I can unpack it. I mean, I'll, I'll be really sure. Well, yeah, it's, it's grandparents. Like, there are not many parents in the book. Um, they're, they're grandparents in the book. And I mean, like, I think, again, there's, there's a critique I'm making of, of uh, parenting actually, and, and this notion of like a traditional family. So, you know, I grew up, grandmothers and grandfathers, particularly grandmothers, were there much more than mothers or fathers. And, and, and I think some literature and some songs <coughs> and pop culture, I think, shows and explores this, but not enough. And um, again, initially the book was just like, I was exploring the relationship, the psychological relationship, the sexual relationship, the traumatic relationship between grandmothers and grandsons, and that black grandmothers and Sons. And I think that's something I don't really see a lot of, but most young black men that I knew had some relationship with their grandmother. I'm not saying they all want to fuck their grandmother and be stupid like that. I mean, that may not be stupid, but whatever. I'm not saying that. Um, but what I am saying is that, I, that the first woman I ever saw naked was my grandmother. And when I'm talking to my boys, I'm like, oh, that's the first woman I ever saw naked too. And like, you know, so what does that, for example, like, what, does that, what does that mean? And so anyway, I, I, I just think there are a lot of like cultural mores that I heard, shared, digested that I did not see in American lit. So I wanted to try to bring it to life. Is it like kind of a critique to, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but sort of, of of the civil rights generation too, that there's this like gap, there's this absence of parents mm -hmm. as, as far as his grandparents, you know, the sort of James Baldwin generation right. and the Ralph Ellison generation and there's the kids. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I'm not gonna say that I think that that is it, but I think that's part of part of it. You know, my my um my grandmother raised her children, her grandchildren, and her great. And she, now she raised her great grandchildren, um, and, and and there's a there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Like I guess the Buchanans of the world will talk about like the family breakdown, right? The cultural war, family breakdown. But for 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 me and for us, I think a lot of us in Mississippi. Um, it, it was a bit more complicated, and it was it was an attempt on our parents' part to uh, consciously and unconsciously like fuel us with what they felt was tradition, right? I think that's part of what it, like uh, making this uh, extended the extended family is all about. And so, I just think you can do that in ways other than Medea and you know things like that. <laughs> no, I'm not knocking my parents. Uh, I mean, I'm knocking for the last movie he made, <laughs> but I do think a lot of criticism of him comes from people who don't don't understand Southern tradition. Southern tradition um, at all. Um, can, can, I, can I ask questions? Sure. <laughs> I could, yeah, please jump in, because no, otherwise I'm just going to put you on the spot. I'm, I'm ready. So. Um, and this, and this, is, this, is, this is like super staying question. All right. all right? Like super staying. I wanted to ask you this when you, were, uh, when you came, remember when you came to my class and you don't remember coming? <laughs> <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to ask you this. Um, do you still you could, so you were up there, and I was like getting all red up here. And <laughs> Do you but, still listen? Do you still listen to hip hop? Yeah, uh, I have to. Um, uh, well, I mean, you know, I, I I have to because because it's part, you know, of, of how.
how I grew up and who I am. Um, and I also have to, because I'm a dad and I have a 16 year old um, as well. So there's a really interesting relationship there. Um, and I also, you know, I work at Stanford and I work around all of these young folks. And so, uh, so I literally, I'm in my office and I have to listen to Trinidad and James because they, they've opened it downstairs, right? Okay. So, uh, so I mean it in all those different types of ways, but I do, I really do. Um, I noticed you were listening to Big Crit when you were writing this. Yeah. Uh, right, that was sort of the person who... I mean, he grew up right down the road from the imaginary place that I'm writing about in that, in that book. Um, <laughs> Specifically, more importantly, does any art move you the way that that music moves you? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, there's sort of the generational thing, right? Like right. when you're when you're 20 and and you hear you know these young boys in the hood for the first time, and you're scared out of your skull. Right. Like sitting in the room by yourself, listening to this coming up, you know, transmitted from KPO across the bay, and you're in the room and you're it's dark and boys in the hood comes on you like. <laughs> oh my God! Right. That's the scariest thing I ever heard. But it's also the most um, intriguing and, and and real thing that you ever heard. It, yeah. it, it describes like what's happening on right outside your door. Right. You know what I mean? Um, right on the corner where folks are are selling crap. Right, right, right down. Like when you look out the window. Yeah. Um, and when you look out the back window, you can see the cops beating on on the on the sellers later in the evening or whatever. You yeah. know. I mean, that's, that was real. That was like, wow, you know? Um, and I don't know that, I'll, I mean, I'll ever feel okay. that way again, right? I don't know that I'll ever feel like I'm 24 and I know everything I know there is, I, that there is to know about the world. And then hear Ice Cube and feel like, wow, what just happened here? Right. I have to confront that. Right. Um, so I don't, I don't know that I'll ever feel that way. And I don't try to, you know? I, I, know. I, was, I was at uh, University of Maryland yesterday talking to a lot of younger folks and I said, look, I'll never feel Trinidad James the way, uh, you know, I'll feel a tribe called Quest. And that's just an age thing, right. most probably. Uh, but then they were saying, oh, we don't feel Trinidad James either. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, so I, I think that that's part of it, you know. But I, I do, I mean, you, you, can't help, you can't help but be moved. I, I mean, I read your book and I was incredibly, you know, powerfully moved. I think art, um, can still do that. I don't think that you lose those, I don't think that you become inured to, you know, the emotions that art, music, literature, dance, performance can evoke. Um, and that's what you live for. I mean, it becomes what you live for. If you do get to that point, then um, then, then that's when we really need to intervene, right? Yeah, we need yeah. to really to work on that. And so for me last year, hearing Kendrick Lamar mm -hmm. having this conversation with folks my age, mm -hmm. right? With Snoop Dogg, mm -hmm. with even the game, mm -hmm. who's like, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. five or six years older than him, maybe maybe more than that, mm -hmm. you know, and forcing all of these rappers to actually change up their styles mm -hmm. and rethink themselves mm -hmm. in light of what this, you know, twenty-something kid is right. saying, you know, that was powerful to me, and I, sure. I that's what yeah. I, you know, I live for that. I live for the moment that my kid walks in and is like, Dad, that's not, that's that's whack. Like, listen to this, right. you know. So, yeah. Um, I, so I th we wanted this to really be a, a conversation with everybody in the room, and so uh, I think we want to open it. But actually, can I ask you one more question? Okay. Just, uh, okay. Right. So no, because I, I think this is really really deep uh, because uh, you you were writing about Tupac, um, and you had this quote, and I just want to read this because um, it was it was really powerful to me, and I didn't really know why, yeah. and I just wanted you to maybe help me through it. Um, you wrote, I didn't know much as a 21-year-old, this is kind of fits what we were just talking about. I didn't know much as a 21-year-old in the fall of 1996, but I knew intimately the ways that black American ambition, that black American ambition unchecked by healthy doses of fear would lead to slow, painful deaths. And I think this refers to also the essay that you wrote on gun violence. 
the, the, you know, the, the lead piece in the Gawker, which is, you know, the best thing that the internet has ever produced. Uh, I can't figure out how someone so brilliant, so committed to honest exploration, so willing to fight for us, with us, and against us, could ever live beyond 25 years of age in our United States. Because you know, I was I was around. I was dealing with a lot of people who were talking about Tupac, and we we're all trying to remember Tupac. And, and you know, I'm 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 that age where I can remember. I'm I'm that age, and I'm from a place in the country where I can remember people literally saying, "Fuck Tupac, he's a wannabe Ice Cube," right? And so when I say this to young younger people, they you know even people who like me, they often want to fight, right? Because Tupac has been he's a deity now to people. And, and I don't say that to try to, and, 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 and t t Tupac is crazy inspirational to me, but, but I also say that to say, I, I, I literally remember when, when we thought Tupac, uh, like, I remember literally saying, man, like, he, he just, his voice isn't strong enough. That's crazy to say now, because that's what, you know, that's what he, you know, like, uh, the long ease, right? That's what he's known for, but I remember, like, the stacking of the vocals, he was, he was other things to his vocals, but all that to say, when he got shot, you know, people now, I guess the lore is, oh, we thought he was just going to survive because that's what he did. But I, I was just was surrounded by people who were like, that motherfucker about to die. Because that's what we do. We get shot and we die. And so, you know, there's nothing profound about that. We all know that. But I just think that a lot of the lore around Tupac, and, and, and I appreciate his different perspectives. And I know he got shot nine times before, but for me it was never, oh, he got shot he got shot this time, he's gonna live. For a lot of us, it's like, he wilder, he wilder. And, 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 and he's, uh, and, 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 and the, contradict the contradictory part of it is that not only is he wilder, he's too brilliant to be alive. He's too, you know, so I think that the second part of that quote is that, um, you know, there's a, there's a point, I think, in all of our lives when we, uh, you know, you said you have a 16 year I don't have any kids, but when I got my job at Vassar, <laughs> And, and I started getting money, and money started coming into my hands and going into some of my family's hands, I couldn't do shit I used to do, right? Like, steal stupid shit. <laughs> Straight for example. <laughs> like, say crazy things to policemen. And, and what I saw in Tupac was like, someone who it appeared just didn't, that didn't happen. And, and I admired it, but I also, it, that has to end violently, particularly for us. And I think this is where money is important in race. I think for some people, uh, there, there's a cushion. They can do that shit, and they can fall, they can bounce. And they can do it again, they can fall, they can bounce. They can do it again, they can fall, they can bounce. Tupac was a millionaire. He wasn't about to bounce. So that's how I think race is so important, you know? He's dead for a number of reasons. One of the reasons he's dead because he's a black motherfucker. Like, in that, that's why this post-race narrative shit is important. But, like, let's just look at reality. Millionaires are not falling and bouncing. Black millionaires are falling and dying in hip-hop and other, other forms. So, anyway... I didn't think we were gonna talk about that essay, but that's what I thought. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, Actually, cool. I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. But, sorry but, but the maestro, <laughs> let me know. But I got one more thing, though. <laughs> <laughs> one more thing. All right, all right. And this is really important, especially for those of us who are of Asian American descent in the room, because one of the things I found really interesting about one of the subplots in Long Division is you have in your night there's a 1964 thread that's happening. Yeah. And you have a character there whose name is Evan Alshuler, who is uh, a Jewish, am I giving too much away? No, nah, it's like, I, I stole that name from one of my students, I was trying to oh, see yeah? <laughs> <laughs> He told me it was okay, I could use his name, but I was just trying to see if he was here. But he's a really, for me, it was a really, really interesting character. Yeah. Because what happens is, you put him through these crazy paces, it's just right, right, right. unreal what you put him through. Um, but uh, the one thing that he has to do over and over again is confront the fact 
And your lead character is City, yeah. who is, his real name is Citroen, right? Yeah. So he's citizen, right? right? French citizen. Yeah. Um, the, the French word for citizen, mm -hmm. which is powerful in itself. And Shalaya, the two main characters, challenge him constantly on whether he's white or not. Right. Right? You're, you're white, you're white. <laughs> oh no, I'm Jewish. I'm Jewish. Right? <laughs> right? Uh, you don't even know I'm Jewish. Right. Like, I can't even tell you right. how it's been for us Jewish folks. Um, and you put him through the paces, and not only him, but his family, yeah. through the paces of, of this particular um, uh, situation of trying to figure out where they stand yeah. within this. And I thought that that was really powerful um, because I think, especially for us to, that are coming uh, through this immigration reform debate, yeah, right, where where a lot of times you get what's framed as the good immigrant and the bad immigrant, mm -hmm. right? So, so there's this notion that these immigrants have come in and they'll just actually become white, just like the rest of everybody, right? Right, um, that they're hardworking, that they're ambitious, that all they want to do is contribute to. American society and that yeah. kind of thing. You know, sorry, I said American. I just said American. American. <laughs> I, didn't even, I didn't even plan to, but just American society. Right? American society. Okay, so it, it, but yeah, you know that this is going on, and I thought that that was really. I was, <laughs> and you could have been thinking about the immigration debate, but you had to been thinking about um, black folks' relationship to other folks of color when Absolutely. you were writing that, right. um, and and the the ways in which. Um, you know, other folks of color can adopt this whiteness. Mm -hmm. um, were you? Yeah, I was definitely thinking about that. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be quick, but one of the things I think if we go back is that uh, initially there's this contest that happens early in the book, and in the contest, the protagonist has a beef with uh, a Mexican American girl, right? And initially, like years ago, when I wrote that, the, the woman was a, it was a South Asian woman and her brother. And, and her brother. And this is when I was I was signed to uh, Penguin, and and my editor was just like, you know, we got we, we can't we can't run that we can't run that we can't run that, and 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 again at that point you know I was really interested in thinking about Black South Asian relationships uh, dramatically, and and the editor was just like, no, that's not gonna fly, it's not gonna fly. We, you have to you have to do something different, particularly because you're in Mississippi, and you know why not use some other group like Mexicans because there's so many more Mexicans, there's still a lot of Mexicans. According to her, a lot of Mexicans in Mississippi. So, uh, what I'm saying is, like, I think that's incredible. He picked up a lot of what I was attempting to do in that, and bringing like that 1964 Jewish character into the book was done for a number of reasons. One is that when I went back and I did some research and interviewed some older Jewish people who were involved in the civil rights movement, uh, I met this one family who said that one of the tactics that the Klan used against their family, you know, who knows if it's really true or not, but they said was that the Klan encourage them, parts of their family, to put on masks and go terrorize black bodies. Like this was a form of terror. And, and what they wanted me to understand much more than the bodies they almost or did or did not terrorize was like think about what that means to feel like you have to go terrorize other folks of color in order to survive. And so, you know, I thought the story was compelling or whatever, so that's why I tried to create Evan Osler based off of that, uh, off of that character. And in my conversation with these, with these Jewish families, the idea of whiteness was like, which is just, it's just rampant, right? Because on one hand, they wanted to be like, you can call me white all you want, but if I was white, that wouldn't have happened to my family. And of course, I'm trying to push back against that in the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, but the last thing I'll say is there's this point where Evan Oshler, the, black, the Jewish guy, is like, you know, you, you, you're so mad at me, but what would happen if they came to you to get us? You know what I'm saying? If the Klan was like, we're going to come to y'all, the black community, to go get the Jewish people, what would you do? And the kids are like, bruh, that's never going to fucking happen. <laughs> that's never going to happen. But then the Jewish guys is like, OK, you know, we imagine, though. What would you do? And then, and then and I don't know if you remember that, about it, but in that book, in, in that, that moment, both of the characters look at each other, and they can't say shit, because they know what they would do. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm trying to complicate that whole thing. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking a lot about immigration, but also ways that like whiteness is more complicated than definitely, I think. I don't even want to say that. I guess it's true. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I guess. I, <laughs> it's, just like, it's just like conversations like this, yeah. it's like they always come up. But, well, it's good. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It does, yeah. I love, you know, yeah, I love, 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 love,
So a lot of these rappers, and we all know, you know, we use words to destroy and just detonate women's bodies. That's what all of the rappers do. But one of the beautiful things about rap is that X, when it does confront white supremacy, it confronts white supremacy. We expect more truth from rappers than we do politicians. I expect more truth from rappers than I do my colleagues, partially because we're talking to one another. And, and, and that may be the answer to this question. LL, I guess, felt like he was talking to Paisley and his audience, so maybe he thought that's why he could do that. I don't know. But whatever the case is, I just think it's interesting that in that situation, I'm, I don't think the worst Southern rapper on earth would have written something so foolish, ahistorical, and, and, and potentially dangerous. I don't actually think it's dangerous because I don't think people really care about that song. But it's potentially dangerous to say to white supremacy, I'm going to make a deal with you. If I do this, history don't matter. Potentially, that's dangerous. And it's dangerous in public policy, and it's dangerous in, in, in words. And I just think, I think, you know, if y'all don't feel like LL dis, you know, like misrepresented you as New Yorkers, I think you should feel that way. Because if, if, if that shit came out of Big Crit, David Banner's mouth, which would never, like we, would, we would have some words for him. You know, he wouldn't be able to just come back and just, oh, sorry, y'all. No. <laughs> Not to white supremacy. I wanted to thank both y'all uh, for coming out here. Um, I wanted to maybe build on the uh, topic that you were talking about right before the Q&A. Um, so I think Jeff earlier, you said that like what America needs right now is a really brutally honest conversation on race, right? And I think the subtext of that is we need a conversation between people of color and white people, right? Um, but I was kind of wondering um, if the dynamics of that change when it's between a person of color and another person of color, right? Um, I'm kind of thinking about like after 92, the Rodney King riots, right? Uh, a lot of tension between the uh, black community and the Korean Americans in LA. Um, you know, and, and you know, there can be a lot of tension between uh, different uh, communities, uh, minority communities, right? So I was wondering, uh, you know, how did, did the parameters change when it's between a person of color and another person of color? Thanks. That's an awesome question, and I think that um, I think that it does shift. I think the parameters shift uh, uh, a lot, um, and it used to be this thing. I think so. The the conceit of multiculturalism was sort of that if we were able to get all our stories out, because at that point it was like everybody's in the same boat together, right? We're all under underrepresented. We're not getting any kind of representation at all. There's an absence of representation. There's the presence of misrepresentation for all of us. So. Multiculturalism is everybody kind of getting in this boat and saying we're all sailing onto shore and we're gonna, you know, go and storm the city or that kind of thing, whatever. I'm, I'm mixing all my metaphors up. Um, but but what was interesting and clear is that multiculturalism as an arts movement um, really collapsed um, around 92, 93, 94, um, partly because of the first multicultural riots, right? The Los Angeles riots in 1992. Um, and then you had a huge backlash that was coming um, right here in New York City. A lot of establishment critics um, were pushing back against all of the work that was being done in identity. And if you get a chance to see, I haven't seen it yet, I'm gonna try to go tomorrow um, or on Saturday, but the 1993 show we had a lot of folks who I know um, who are in it. Uh, the 1993 exhibition at the New Museum tries to actually capture this moment before the critics really pushed back. Mm. And so, you know, for instance, this year we're looking at trying to do an event around how people do race and identity in contemporary visual art. And a lot of artists of color, like, were just very on edge. They didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. Because it meant that they would have to come out politically, publicly, and they might get pinned, right. you know, as, oh, that's the artist that does race. Um, so the discussion that happened 20 years ago is, is, has been silenced, and it's still that way, and I think that's indicative of, of the larger conversation around race that's happening. Um, you mentioned earlier, too, now, that Obama has to talk about race in certain kinds of ways. ta Coates um, has written really, really well about this. Swa has written um, about this as well. You know, um, whiteness is a different kind of thing now, and, and Obama has to play himself in relationship to that whiteness in a much different kind of way. Um, and that is, is unbelievably frustrating. And so 
you get the onion that used to be really, really good on race, yeah. doing the crazy stuff that they did around Kivenja Ne Wallace, right? So, so that conversation has to, by all means, happen. And I feel like that we're, in some ways, at the beginning of this again. Um, it's almost like every generation has to recreate the, the race conversation, mm -hmm. you know, and pick it, up, pick it up where the previous generation uh, got either, uh, they either dropped the ball or it, it, it got, you know, it, it, it got swallowed up and they were repressed, um, like in the case of visual art. Um, and the, but, the, but the thing that I'm optimistic about is that the conversations between races, mm -hmm. between folks of color, has advanced a lot uh, since, since 1992. Um, I see it in the community organizing world, and I see it in the arts making world. Those folks who are working around race and identity, I think, have been able to build a uh, new language together. Maybe, again, maybe I'm just glass half full, more optimistic, naive, and stupid. Um, but I think that that's uh, happened quite a bit, you know, so that you see, in a lot of respects, uh, folks who are working uh, not in this sort of uh, essential, essentialist kind of way around identity, but folks taking leadership and looking at the ways in which different things come together. And I'm thinking, for instance, of people like organizers like Ai Jin Pu, right, who organizes domestic workers. Um, uh, you know, she was one of the folks who came out of the same generation that we did um, and took a lot of uh, the shock and the trauma of the riots uh, to heart and now is doing amazing multiracial uh, organizing around domestic workers. Um, and, you know, with Culture Strike, I think that we've been trying to do that as well. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work around immigration. And, uh, and it's very important for us to be able to see how this impacts everybody um, in a lot of different types of ways. And, and, uh, and so I'm optimistic in that sense. I think that the conversation has moved forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have the tools to be able to move these conversations forward. What's lacking is, in some ways, a national will uh, to be able to do that. Um, and, uh, and we have to pull, create spaces to do it. But here's the stakes. The stakes are that whatever this amorphous group is that elected Obama to office in 2008, and then came back in 2012 and elected him again, um, whatever this amorphous group is, could be a new majority, a new cultural majority, right? Like, we're not at a point anymore where we're all minorities. Right. Together we can form a cultural majority. And my question is, what is that majority gonna stand for? You know, what are the values that we're gonna stand for? What's our, our, our uh, what's the culture that we're gonna be advancing? Uh, be pushing towards? What are the visions that we're, that we're going to be putting out into the world? Because ultimately, right, if we're trying to, okay, I'm rambling, right, but I just want to say this. Um, the right only needs to say that we need to restore things, right? They can just hearken back to this past that was much, so much better back then, right? Which, of course, it wasn't, right? Um, but they can just say, oh, this is how Pat Buchanan begins his book. He says, you know, whatever happened to the America that we all grew up in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what America did you grow up in? I can tell about America I grew up in. Yeah. Um, but that's, his, that's how he starts it, right? So it's this imperial nostalgia, right? Um, but progressives, we always have to push a new vision. We have to push something new out there. We have to make people believe in things that haven't been seen yet, right? Belief, hope in the things that are unseen, right? Um, we have to like hear a world that hasn't been like heard yet. We have to tell a world that hasn't been told yet. You know, so so we are our, our, our burden, our special burden is that we have to pull people forward into something that they haven't necessarily imagined yet. And that's I think our job. I think that's the job of all of you who are twenty years old in here over the next over your lifetimes. So there you go, now you have your job. Um, and this is again a, a really uh, stupid question, but those are sometimes the best questions. Uh, is it possible for this younger generation, or, or us, or whatever, to pull ourselves and the nation into you know this kind of healthy counter movement if we 
soulfully, spiritually, are unhealthy. Like, I'm really interested in thinking about like what political movement has to do with it, with the, co the the collective, but also the individual. Like, if we like, how important is it for us to be healthy if we're going to create healthy movement? Yeah, I think it's really, really crucial. I think it's central to it. I mean, we're sort of, you know, the generation that is about self care. Yeah. I don't think it was a word back then, right? Right. Um, and and sort of uh, also the generation that, that recognizes the healing. I know it's deep in your writing, um, in your book of essays, as well as in Long Division. Um, and, and I mean, it's all there in the Gawker essay, right? Um, this, this notion of, of folks who are pulling guns are just as broken um, as, as the folks who are, uh, you know, on the other side of the gun, as, as, as uh, Kendrick Lamar would say. Gentlemen, um, so. we have three ladies waiting to ask you questions. I'm sorry. So anyway, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Um, Yeah, I think it's important. Just saying. Sorry, my man. No, 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 just. Correct us, No, no, I'm, I'm, I was thinking from before, it had a lot to do with what you were talking about uh, recently, uh, right now, about whiteness. And something that really freaked me out was watching the freak out in November when the folks were, you know, the white establishment is no longer a majority, and all of that, you know. Uh, and thinking at uh, the fact, like you were saying, that Jewish people were no, not white before, and neither were Italians, and neither were Irish, and neither were Greeks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that in a way, whiteness has remained a majority by continually absorbing others into that whiteness so that it becomes and continues to have that status. So the thing that makes me nervous um, is white Latinos, are we next? Is this it? Is this, the, is this the seduction of whiteness that is gonna come and say, no, you too, come, come, wear the little thing, you know? And, um, and in our own countries, a lot of times, that is already the case, right? The whiteness is there, and it operates in that racist way. And so when you guys were talking right now around solidarity and around that future and that hope, in what are we gonna stand for, I would really caution and warn uh, any, like, you know, easily identifiable or co-opted as white people of color, that perhaps we were not, and I'm speaking here for myself and others, that in our own countries might not have been thinking of ourselves as people of color, because we were all Puerto Rican, whatever, you know, right. like we're all, it, then it's jumping the puddle that then you get in solidarity with a bunch of other people that are people of color, and that has been so valuable. And I really uh, hope that the seduction of whiteness isn't such that then we are co-opted into that and forget all about the beauty of what we've been able to do together. So is it seductive? Can I ask can I throw a yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. Is it seductive? I think that in terms of power, I don't think it's not seductive for, for me. you. Yeah, okay. It is not seductive for me. Okay. But I do think that in terms of power, uh, there is a sense in which it still functions in a certain way. That uh, in the same way that in a lot of ways, maleness, right? You know, masculinity still functions in a certain way. So just to be careful, you know, to surf that that little wave there with caution, uh, because it's really old, you know, it's really old that it that that is power. And so we, in part of this rewriting, is rewriting our own position as people of color and redefining that so that we don't fall prey to the like, okay, now you too, come on. Mm -hmm. So anyway, just wanted to throw that out. Thank you. like savvy and stuff are really important, savvy, uh, all of that. But I, I think you tell the truth. And, and, and I think you reckon with the truth. And, and if you're in front of a, uh, an audience of folks who you think you need to lie to, 
probably should tell that audience the truth. That's, that, I mean, that, that's, that's what I've learned in, in, in my little short time on Earth. And we can talk about that, but, uh, you know, Grandma would say, lying never, never really ends up helping you. And, and, and so my problem with LL Cool J, and I don't know why I keep talking about it, but I just think he lied. And I think he lied because he felt like he needed to lie to those people. But we've seen over and over again, like, lying to those people, it, like, what happens? Like, lying to a, a, a white, rural country audience, for what? And, and then trying to fool the rest of us and be like, well, now the dialogue is started. Now you got a lot of us, too. You see what I'm saying? It's like literally what happens in real life. You lie, you have to lie again. You lie. And so now that love's going all over, all over the country, lying to us. Even though you heard me say that, what I really said was, motherfucker, that's a lie. <laughs> we heard what you said. So I just, think, I just think we have to be willing to excavate and reckon with the truth, no matter where the audiences are. And, and, and then the harder part is, is, is changing based on that truth that we excavate, right? Like, how do, we, how do we change in the way we live our lives, change public policy based on the truth? But we can't even get there because we like, are, are like literally obsessed with lying. I am. I mean, maybe you are, but a lot of us are obsessed with it. And so I just think anytime we can tell the truth, we really have to try to push ourselves to tell the truth. That's my lame answer. What, what you got? No, but, but I can't talk that. <laughs> That one's for me. Um, I, you know, it's so. The, so those of you who have heard me speak before, I've probably heard this story before. Um, but every time uh, I went out for about five, six, even now, actually, five, six years around, can't stop, won't stop. The number one question I would get would be, "What's the Chinese Hawaiian guy doing writing about hip hop?" Right? It was just a. It was folks just didn't get it. It used to get me really mad. Um, and, and I've finally, I think, now reconciled myself uh, and, 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 and sort of understand fully, you know, kind of what's going on and overstand, I guess, in the Zulu Nation, I overstand it now. Um, so, on the one hand, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the notion that hip-hop is a black thing, which it is. It could not have begun as anything but a black thing in the place that it began in, with all of these different types of Afro-diasporic cultures and Afro-Caribbean and Afro-Latino uh, folks interacting with African Americans in this space to produce what became hip hop. It's just factual, right? It's just factual. Um, so that's absolutely what's up. But on the other hand, like I'm a hip hop cliche, <laughs> right? I, I grew up, you know, with Rapper's Delight, I, I you know, I dress uh, in, in bright colors when Native Tongues came along, right? I, uh, I was, you know, at the clubs trying to, you know, wave my glass when, you know, when Diddy and them were doing their thing. I just, I did it all, right? I just like, I'm a cliche, right? I'm a hip-hop cliche. Um, Geo and Blue Scholars, they're hip-hop cliches, right? Heems, Das Racist, are they still together? Um, they're not, right? So sad, so sad. But, they're, you know, they're hip-hop cliches as well. They tell you that, I think, too. You know, we're all hip-hop cliches. We're all hip-hop. The gift, the gift that Afro-diasporic cultures gave to the world through hip-hop was the gift to be able to express the specificity of your stories. Um, and I think that that's uh, something that needs to be recognized, understood, um, respected. And that's the beginning of communication, really. That's the beginning of where we can start having these conversations, these real conversations that kind of need to be able to take place um, that will pull us forward to where, where we want to go, right? Uh, away from this monoculture of whiteness 
you know, towards the radical idea that the multiculturalists espouse, which is a sort of radical diversity. And, and I just think we also have to be allow ourselves, um, we have to allow words and people to obliterate cliché. So we're all cliché, for example. Um, if we look at uh, what happened with Rick 